my words are not my words, but his words, what he would have you hear this morning. We're going to be looking, as I mentioned earlier, at um, Jacob and the scripture that Martin had highlighted is in uh, Genesis 32. But actually, in isolation, to me, when I read it, it didn't make a lot of sense. As is often the case with scripture, you have to go back. You have to know what's gone before for it to make any sense. So I want to pick up where Martin left off last week. We were looking at Abraham and the near sacrifice of Isaac. And interesting that Lee mentioned that film this morning um, because the one thing that stuck with me uh, about the, the talk last week was how close did that knife get? How close to sacrificing Isaac did Abraham have to come before God intervened and fulfilled the blessing, the promise that he had given. He'd given that promise, and God is always true to his promise, and Abraham knew that, but how close did he come? That's a very, very powerful image. So Isaac obviously grows up, and um, he then becomes a family man himself. Now, he marries Rebecca, and they have twins, and we meet them first in Genesis 25. Genesis is an amazing book. If you've never taken the time to read the book of Genesis, it's incredible. It's got the best plot lines of any soap opera I have ever seen. There's everything in here. There's sibling rivalry, there's lying, deceit, cheating, manipulation, murder, everything. We're not very far into the book of Genesis. In fact, in the Pew Bibles, it's on page 8, when God says, this is going so badly, I'm going to destroy it all. It's very, very early on in the book. And that really struck me when I started to read that it's only in the sixth chapter of what we call the Bible that God says, you are so sinful, you are so far away from me that I've got to start again. And so the story continues. And the heroes of the Bible, I don't know about you, but Jacob, when I'm reading about Jacob, he was really screwed up in a lot of ways. Yet he is one of the heroes of the Bible. He is someone that God used to hand the baton on, the blessing that first came through Abraham and then Isaac and then passed on to Jacob, that they would be, their descendants would be a blessing to all nations, that their descendants would be more than the numbers of grains of sand on the seashore. And he's so normal. What an incredible encouragement to us sitting here today. He wasn't sitting there praying all day, every day. He was normal, and he spent a lot of his life doing everything in his own strength. So when Rebecca falls pregnant with these twins, God tells her that there are two nations that she's carrying through Jacob and Esau, and they battle in the womb. And when they're born, Esau is born first, and Jacob comes out clutching at Esau's heel. I almost feel that if there was room, he would have just pulled him back and got out there first. And he spent a good part of his life doing that. His name, Supplanter, means takes the place of something, someone else, by force or trickery. And that's what we see if we read the story. Esau is favored by Isaac and Jacob by his mother, Rebecca. And Rebecca actually encourages Jacob to be deceitful. She loves him so much, she wants him to have the blessing that should go to the firstborn, as was tradition. But God had already promised her that the older would serve the younger. He'd already said that. But because she is human, and as I'm sure many of us do today, 
it doesn't matter what we believe God says to us. We just have to help him achieve what he said, don't we? We just have to do that thing that he's promised us and we've heard it, but we just need to manipulate it to make sure that it comes true. That is our tendency. That is our humanity. So Esau sells Jacob his birthright for a bowl of stew. Jacob takes advantage of a man who's been out hunting, who's exhausted. He wants what Esau has. And he says, well, you know, sell me your birthright. And Esau's so desperate, he does it. He gives it up very, very easily, or so it appears as we read it in Scripture. And then on top of that, with the help of his mother, he steals the blessing blessing of the firstborn by pretending to be Esau and even though Isaac recognized Jacob's voice he still believed that he was passing on the Isaac the uh, blessing to Esau incredible he knew his voice but still passed on that blessing so Jacob realized Esau is a little bit upset I think it's fair to say he's a little bit upset. He's going to kill him. So Jacob does what all good men of God do, and he runs away. And he goes to Haran, to his uncle. And on the way, he stops to rest. And this is where he has a dream. And we were talking about dreams earlier. And he sees a stairway resting on earth and leading to heaven. Angels going up and down the Lord at the top. God again tells Jacob, as he's passing this blessing on through the generations, he will give his descendants the land he's lying on. And he reinforces the promise that he's already given to both Abraham in Genesis 12 and Isaac later on. And verse 15 of Genesis 28 says, I am with you, and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And it's incredible as you look at that imagery of the stairway, the ladder, it's translated in in some places. You look at that imagery of the bridge between heaven and earth and realize that although it's concealed in the Old Testament, what God is actually doing is revealing the fact that the bridge is coming, the bridge between heaven and earth that is Jesus, is coming. He's giving him a foretaste that there is access. And that only comes through Jesus. And it's incredible that God chooses this cheating, lying, manipulative man to speak to so directly, so powerfully, gives him this precious vision, this precious dream, and promises to stick by him. Let's not miss that. He promises, despite himself, despite all his best efforts to screw it up, that he will stand by his promise and he will be faithful. So when Jacob gets to his uncle, Laban, Laban, however it's said, he turns to be out quite like Jacob. It might be a family trait. He is very, very similar in character. He's not quite as honest as Jacob might have expected. He's manipulative and he's deceitful. And Jacob actually has met his match. Jacob falls in love with his younger daughter, Rachel. And he asks, can he marry her? And uncle says, yes. Except when the marriage ceremony is over, he realizes he's got the wrong sister. He's got the older one, not the younger one. And I don't think it's... I don't think anything happens by mistake in Scripture, just as he stole what was rightfully his older brother's In his younger life, he receives the older sister when what he wanted was the younger one. As it turns out, he gets her as well. 
two for the price of one, if you like. And he really loved Rachel, but God blessed both those sisters. But again, there's that sibling rivalry between sisters this time, jealousy, trying to outdo each other. I'm sure many of you here have been through situations where your brothers and sisters drive you crazy and you're fighting and you're arguing. It was the same then. It's no different. So he had to work for seven years for each of the daughters as his wives. Instead of paying money, he had to work. And then he did an extra six years, so he spent 20 years there. And then he runs away again. This time he's going back home. And that's where we finally get to chapter 32. So Jacob is going back home and he knows that after 20 years he's going to have to face his brother Esau. He's put it off for 20 years. He's run away. He's hidden. He's made a very good life for himself. But his past is still there and it's about to catch up with him. So he sends some messengers to see what reception he might get so that he can plan what he's going to do next. And he hears back that Esau is coming and is bringing 400 men with him. And verse 7 of chapter 32 reads, In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups and the flocks and herds and camels as well. Jacob at this point is still working in his own strength. He's thinking, right, he's coming, he's going to attack me. If he's going to attack me, the best thing to do is halve my whole wealth, my fortune, and then if he kills half of it, I've still got half. They can escape. He's still very much in his own strength. And then... From verse 9, the story changes slightly. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers and their children's. Sorry, children. And then he says, I love this, But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. You have said. Now, did he say, you have said in the way that says, you have said and I'm claiming that promise? Or did he say it more as I would suspect? Well, you said, yeah? slightly different, isn't it? Well, you said, now how are you going to work this one out, God? You said, but it's not looking too good right now. But you said, and God did say. Carrying on from verse 13. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20, sorry, 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels, etc. He put them in care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. 
he really is putting off this meeting with his brother, isn't he? He's sending all these gifts and he's spacing them out because he's trying to buy favor. He's still, you know, hedging his bets. He's still trying to buy favor and buy time because he is so fearful of what is going to happen when he meets Esau. He knows that he betrayed him. He knows he did him wrong. And he knows that Esau has every right to be angry with him. Even after all those years, he expects to have to pay the price. So they go ahead. And then we come to the section that... um, call it the turning point from verse 22 where Jacob wrestles with God and this story may be familiar to you it says that night Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two maidservants and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok after he had sent them across the stream he sent over all his possessions so Jacob was left alone And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Who do you ask my name? Sorry, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. So Jacob has struggled all night with the man, the angel, God himself in some form. Jacob's life has been full of struggle right from the womb when he was fighting with his brother in the womb, with his brother, then his uncle. He's facing another struggle, probably the biggest emotional struggle of his life as he knows he's coming face to face with Esau. And as he goes back to the promised land and he goes through this struggle, he suddenly realizes, and it comes in verse bear with me. Twenty six. I will not let you go unless you bless me. He suddenly realizes that blessing only comes from God. He suddenly realizes that everything else is for nothing unless God blesses him. Now, God can do all things. We can't wrestle God and win. He's God. He came in a form that Jacob could manage to keep going till morning and overcome. But the point of just being able to touch his hip and give him that permanent reminder of who God is just shows us the sovereignty of God. But it shows us the grace of God that he will meet us and he will allow us because we have free will to come to that point where we acknowledge that only God can bless us. How many times... How many times in our lives have we prevented the blessing because we've battled with something and haven't let God have it, haven't let God deal with it? That we've been doing that tug of war that says, God, I need you to do this for me, but I'm not quite ready to let go of it. 
and you have this tug of war, tug of war, and it's not until you submit to God that you're free of that struggle. The interesting thing is that if you read on in this story into chapter 33, when Jacob finally gets to a point where he's about to face his brother, he comes running and embraces him. Echoes of the prodigal son, if ever I saw it. And there's reconciliation because he's submitted to God and God has blessed him. Are you ready to receive the blessing that God has for you, is my question. What is it in your life that you're struggling with? Answers aren't always immediate. Abraham heard the promise of God when he was 75. It wasn't fulfilled till he was 100. God's timing is not our timing, but he is faithful. There is no doubt. If you look at how Jesus' ministry pans out in the New Testament, he chose the Jacobs of his time. Those with no education, the fishermen, who are they? He mixed with sinners and prostitutes, the unloved and the unlovely. So as you sit here today, as you think about where you are on your journey with God, be encouraged. We all get it wrong. Paul tells us in Romans that we all fall short of the glory of God. But we've got Jesus. Jesus has taken on every battle we can ever have, every sin we'll ever commit every struggle we'll ever go through. He's already dealt with it. It's done. It is finished. But what he did say was there will be times of trial. He didn't promise us as Christians that it would all be fluffy and rosy. That is not the way of the Christian life. Sometimes it's really tough. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, about praising God in the tough times. If we can do that, we can do anything. It's easy to praise God when the sun is shining and everything's well with the world. I want to give you a very practical example of how God convicted me of this being ready for the blessing. And it came to me yesterday evening. God speaks to us all in very different ways. He speaks to Jim very directly. He hears a word, he acts on it. You remember the story a couple of weeks ago where, yeah, you're laughing already. I've sold the car. Yeah. I was furious. I was so cross. You have no idea. I was not very Christian. And I haven't been very Christian since, to be honest. Hands up. But I know deep down, that when God speaks to Jim, he hears him. He has that gift. When he speaks to me, I argue a bit, I battle a bit, and I struggle a bit, and I ignore it, and I put it to one side. But it will keep coming back, and it will come back through, through different people. Jim had said something to me this morning, and when we were praying upstairs, Rochelle echoed more or less word for word what Jim had said. And I'm like, okay, God, I hear you. But back to the car. Okay. How are we going to manage with one car then? This is a really stupid thing that you've done. And he said it might be, but God told me to sell the car. It was probably three or four days after Jim gave testimony of doing such a ridiculous thing, and I got much sympathy after the service and offers of counseling (laughs) that um, we discovered that by some... miraculous gift of God that our office that needs to move, which was going to be the other side of Luton, is going to be in St. Albans, for which I do not need a car because I will be going on the train. God knew all of that. He knew that. 
Jim didn't know that. I didn't know that. But because of my human response, it robbed me of actually seeing the blessing for what it was. It meant I couldn't fully enjoy it because in my, hu- in my flesh, I was really cross because I had to say, you got that one right, actually. It would appear you did hear that word. And that's my flaw. I like to be right. <laughs> Come on, girls, we all like to be right, don't we? <laughs> I do like to be right. And I was partly right this week when the other car broke down and we had to walk everywhere. But, you know, that aside, my issue is twofold. One, if I don't see the logic in it, I don't like it. And two, if if I haven't got control of it, I don't like it. I really need to be in control of my life. And I don't know where that comes from. And I do need to deal with that. But I acknowledge that. And there are things in all our lives we battle with. Mine is control and needing to be right. I don't know what yours is. But I know when I read the Bible that the Bible tells me that all these great heroes that we hear about, they were as screwed up as I am. And isn't that fantastic news? Isn't it? There's nothing special about me that puts me up here apart from the fact that God has given me a gift that says, teach. Now, you may be getting nothing out of this. I don't know. I can only give you what God gives me. But he said to me very clearly today that you can sum all of this up, and this came upstairs in the prayer time this morning, with the question, are you ready to receive your blessing? (laughs) few of our blessings doing something upstairs. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> Julia's looking down rather worriedly. Um, but yeah, are you ready? Or is there something in your life that is blocking that blessing? The blessing will still come, but you may not benefit from the fullness of what God has for you. The fullness of life only comes when you accept that God is sovereign when you submit to him wholeheartedly, when you acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord over your life, and you say, do you know what? Even when it doesn't make sense, if you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it anyway. And we're going to get it wrong. But the Bible is the greatest love story ever written. And you should never leave church feeling that a sermon has told you off. Because the underlying fact is that God, as much as he loved Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he loves every single one of us here this morning. He has no favorites. He sacrificed his son for each and every one of us. And all he wants us to do is be in relationship with him. Some of us catch that quicker than others, and that's okay. We're all on an individual path, an individual journey. The Israelites wandered around in the desert for 40 years. They still got into the promised land, but they were all over the place. And sometimes that's what we do, isn't it? We just get so focused on the here and now and the material and the fleshly thing that we can miss what God really has for us. So my prayer today is, whatever that block is, whatever that thing that holds you back is, you may not even know what it is. That may need some prayer. But once you identify what it is, if you surrender it to God, life looks very, very differently. It may be financial. It may be spiritual. It may be physical. Whatever it is, God only wants the best for us. He gave us his best. He gave us Jesus. There's no greater gift. No greater gift. And that's how precious we are. 
So again, are you ready to receive your blessing?